What's up guys, welcome back to Newswave. Well, it looks like the battle between Microsoft and Sony over Activision Blizzard continues on now with regulators taking a bit of a deeper dive into this deal and Sony being right there to poke and prod at Microsoft and regulators. We'll go over that one here today. Also, we are gonna be talking about one of the craziest sales charts you'll ever see with Splatoon 3 having a massive opening in Japan. And Tokyo Game Show is in full swing right now with some pretty good showcases from both Microsoft and Capcom. Guys, if you enjoy these videos, make sure that like button helps out a ton. And if you're new here to the Spawn Wave channel, make sure you subscribe down below. And we're gonna start today with Halo Infinite. We know that split screen campaign co-op has been canceled after 343 had to make the unfortunate announcement in their most recent video talking about the winter update and then their roadmap going into 2023. There's just one problem. You can glitch into split screen campaign co-op in the game. And in fact, Digital Foundry took a better look at this and said that it's excellent. At least that's what they mentioned in the video title at the time. However, after talking more about uh, his thoughts on this, that being John Linneman and kind of the experience playing through a good chunk of the uh, beginning of the campaign, there were still some glitches like at one point, uh, one screen was daytime, another screen was nighttime. They also managed to fall through the floor during a boss battle, but otherwise they were able to play completely through that part of the game. Cutscenes registered fine, and also you would have people teleport around to the correct spots. Basically, it appears to work. And that brings up the question, why is this split screen campaign co-op mode basically locked behind different uh, different parts of the game that you have to glitch around? Well, after reaching out to them, Digital Foundry said, I mean, they just didn't want to answer. So who knows this point, it's anyone's best guess. I assume there's some sort of bug or glitch that John Linneman didn't run into in his time with the campaign co-op that maybe if, uh, if you spent uh, you know, 10, 20 hours in the campaign you would find, but right now doesn't look great in the current situation with 343 and campaign split screen just kind of being locked in the game. Also, we do have Star Ocean, The Divine Force coming out next month, and I'm hopeful for this release. It hasn't been a good run for Star Ocean recently. Good news though, we'll be able to find out for ourselves a bit more when we can play it Next week, we can see this over on Komatsu saying publisher Square Enix and developer Trice will release a demo for Star Ocean The Divine Force on September 20th across PlayStation 5, PlayStation 4, Xbox Series, and Xbox One. In fact, they say the demo will play from the start of Raymond's story and give you about two hours of, of content here to check out. I didn't see anything about it transferring over to the full game. That's something we've seen more and more from Square, so I, I guess it's possible. Again, we'll find out next week or when it launches with this demo. I will certainly be checking this out because I'd like to see a good release here for the Star Ocean series and it kind of get back to that, like that mid-tier JRPG. I'm not expecting this to come out and be game of the year or anything, but based on previous releases, if this can just be in that mid-tier slot, it's an improvement overall. But I guess we'll find out a bit more next week when it releases on the 20th. Oh, and we did get the official release date for Uncharted Legacy of Thieves Collection on PC. It leaked out and it looks like that date was correct from the Epic Game Store. October 19th, they also posted up a PlayStation blog going over some of the extra features that you can enjoy with the PC version specifically. This will be live on Steam and the Epic Game Store. They talk about ultra wide monitor support and a bunch of different graphical features you can adjust like texture and model quality, anastrophic filtering, shadows, reflections, and ambient inclusion. They also spend time putting over the AMD Fidelity FX Super Resolution 2 and a quick look at the minimum and recommended specs. It's not too bad. I mean, an RTX 2070 for uh, 60 frames per second at 1440p high settings sounds about right for a game like this. Uh, you do want to take a look at the storage though, 126 gigabytes on an SSD. So not exactly a small game, but certainly a good game to check out here. And this will just, I think, continue into 2023 with more and more PlayStation games making the jump to the platform. And guys, with some of the quick news out of the way, let's get into the bigger stuff. Let's start right away with Microsoft, Sony, and Activision Blizzard. Feels like we've been talking about this whole thing for a while, and that's because we kind of have. I mean, we have up until like sometime next year for when Microsoft is expecting to close this. I believe that's June 2023. And 
you know what, based on everything happening right now, it's possible it could run up until that date and we don't have an early resolution and close closure for this, which would be unfortunate because I think I'm ready for this deal to get done, but wow, we're, we're getting quite a few quotes back and forth from Sony and Microsoft over this entire thing. First though, let's head over here to gamesindustry.biz and they've been covering this quite a bit. We'll talk about that, that part in a second here though. But we can see at the top, earlier this month, the UK's Competitive and Markets Authority recommended it begin a second phase investigation into the impact of the deal. Now they had, at, they had given Microsoft or asked them to provide statements or evidence that would kind of calm some of these concerns overall. And it looks like Microsoft has not done that. So an in-depth investigation is expected to start this week. And this is where gamesindustry.biz comes in, who's doing what they should be. And that's go back and forth between Sony and Microsoft and get some of these quotes and sound bites that of course drum up a lot of conversation and, and traffic. This part from Sony who responded to the CMA's announcement for this decision, say they do welcome the announcement as you kind of expect from Sony by giving Microsoft control of Activision games like Call of Duty. This deal would have major negative implications for gamers and the future of the gaming industry. We want to guarantee PlayStation gamers continue to have the highest quality gaming experience and we appreciate the CMA's focus on protecting gamers. Wow, that is uh, negative implications. They are not mincing words here at all. And you wouldn't expect Sony and PlayStation to be accepting necessarily of this deal. They want to push back as much as possible because in the, I think, unlikely chance that this gets blocked, that would work out really well for Sony. This is from Microsoft saying, it makes zero business sense for Microsoft to remove Call of Duty from PlayStation given its market leading console position. And Microsoft has been on record several times now saying that they are not going to remove Call of Duty from PlayStation. So at this point, I would assume they won't, but it, it is possible that to start the next generation, which is kind of where the deal that allegedly Phil Spencer had sent to Jim Ryan and PlayStation was going to more or less run out. It was like 2027, 2028, when you would think, okay, the next Xbox series and the PlayStation 6 would come out. That would give Microsoft a huge boost to start the generation if Call of Duty was only on their platform. And that's what PlayStation is more or less looking towards, like the next 10 years. Not necessarily like, okay, what's gonna happen three years from now because we have a deal that says it will be there. What's gonna happen when we wanna launch our next piece of hardware? Because I mean, the entire games industry could be completely different and I would actually expect it to be different by then. But the one thing that appears to be like like a rock in this industry is that Call of Duty comes out and it sells. And I'll admit, I'm actually surprised that all of this has become as public as it is now with just quotes, quotes from Sony and Microsoft seemingly going back and forth, responding to each other and the decisions almost in real time with gamesindustry.biz certainly uh, being on it for all of that. I think at this point though, I'm just ready for the deal to go through so we can move on after all this is done. Next up, let's talk about Xbox's showcase at Tokyo Game Show because they actually had quite a few games to talk about here with many of them going into Game Pass, some right away. Let's start over here though on news.xbox.com. They did have a summary at the top, but I mean, there were 22 games that were at least highlighted here. However, their summary mostly goes over the games that are going into Game Pass. We have Deathloop, for example, coming to Xbox Series X and S on September 20th. That will be available as part of Xbox Game Pass. And this was expected after it leaked early on the Xbox Store. So there you go. Next week, you'll be able to check it out. I recommend it, by the way. I think Deathloop is very good. Then we had Assassin's Creed Odyssey, Danganronpa V3 Killing Harmony. We had Melodies of Steel, Nino Kuni, Wrath of the White Witch Remastered, all of which available on Xbox Game Pass right now. So again, some good ones in there. Nino Kuni is an awesome game if you haven't checked it out. And I guess for Assassin's Creed games that have released recently, Odyssey was one of the better ones. And then it looks like Blaze Blue, Cross Tag Battle Special Edition, and Guilty Gear Strive, which was a big time announcement, is coming to Game Pass in the future. Now they did show off more about Ayudin Chronicle 100 Heroes, but I have to say, Wo Long Fallen Dynasty? That looks good. Good, like I, I am really excited for that game. It's supposed to be coming out in like the first quarter of 2023 and will be finding its way 
into Game Pass uh, immediately on its release. So overall, looking up and down their, their Tokyo Game Show, it's about what I expected. Obviously, they were trying to appeal to the Japanese audience here and to their overall Xbox Game Pass subscriber base and potential subscribers. They're just continuing to try to add more and more value to Game Pass, and they're doing a pretty good job here. Even like Guilty Gear Strive, that's really cool to see that go in there. It will give more exposure overall for the Guilty Gear franchise, which apparently Guilty Gear Strive has sold over a million copies, so that's really good for Guilty Gear. And the game itself looks awesome, but certainly check out some of the games that dropped in the Game Pass and definitely keep Wo Long on your radar because the showing they had here was really cool. Next up, let's talk about the Famitsu sales charts as it gave us our first look as to how Splatoon 3 did in its opening week. Nintendo already told us that it sold over 3.4 million copies in Japan alone, but Famitsu will actually give us an idea as to the digital to physical split even. And you know what? It just looks ridiculous when you see the sales charts. Like, we'll take a look here at the top 10. Starting with Splatoon 3. <clears throat> 1.9 million copies sold, which is a very lopsided looking chart here. Remember, Nintendo told us 3.45 million had sold in its first three days, and that would include digital sales. So that basically shows us that, yes, there were more physical copies sold, but it's getting closer and closer to that 50-50 split for a brand new release. And I think it's possible that Splatoon 3 even sold out with this kind of number. So maybe some were like, well, I, if, if I want it, I'm just gonna have to buy it on the eShop itself. But about 1.5 million sold digitally there. Then if you go to number two, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, 12,605. So pretty big jump there from two to one. And then we have Minecraft on the Switch, Nintendo Switch Sports, Ring Fit Adventure, Earth Defense Force 6, Kirby and the Forgotten Land, Super Smash Brothers Ultimate, Alice Gear Aegis CS, and then Monster Hunter Rise plus Sunbreak. Moving over to the hardware, the Nintendo Switch at the top, 182,876. Uh, again, a pretty good jump from last week, and this is to be expected with Splatoon 3 releasing, obviously. People are gonna be picking up Switch systems to then also be able to play their Splatoon 3 game. You know, this is a good jump, but we've seen bigger jumps before, so I'm starting to think that this is uh, something more reflective of systems just selling out. We know there, the chip shortage has caused issues when it comes to supply, so I wouldn't be shocked if we're kind of seeing the roof of sales with what the Switch is capable of just from the stock in stores at 182 thousand units. The PlayStation 5 below that 2,864, then the Xbox Series 459, the 3DS is 74, and then the PS4 at 11. So you can kind of see how much focus went to the Switch when it comes to hardware sales, and then obviously to Splatoon 3 when it comes to software. And I mean, do we need any more confirmation at this point? Splatoon is one of Nintendo's major franchises. I, I, we're probably gonna get some crazy number when they're ready to talk to investors about global sales for Splatoon 3. Clearly, it is going to sell more than Splatoon 2, and that already did really, really well for Nintendo. Splatoon 3, to me, has over 20 million lifetime sold written all over it, and that puts it alongside of things like the Legend of Zelda or any big 3D Mario games. And while I know there's like universal hype when we see like a big new Zelda game or a new Mario game, specifically a big new 3D Mario game, Splatoon is, is up there. That's, that's a game that obviously pulls a ton of interest and a ton of sales. And it wasn't too long ago that Nintendo created Splatoon. It's not even 10 years old. Remember, it was a new IP during the Wii U era, which was a very weak time for Nintendo, but Splatoon 2 exploded onto the scene on the Switch in its first year, and things continue along here with Splatoon 3. So big time sales from Splatoon, and something tells me this is gonna be a big, big franchise for Nintendo going forward. And in our last bit of news, let's talk about Capcom's show at TGS. It was mostly updates around games that have already been announced, but there were some pretty cool announcements in there. Anyway, let's start from the top with Street Fighter VI. This is clearly their, like their big, big game for TGS where they're having demos for it and really having a pretty big informational blowout here. Now, they did give more information on World Tour 
and Battle Hub, as well as some character reveals. That includes Ken, Blanca, Dalzim, and Ihanda. All of them looked really good. I think I think Blanca in particular looked really cool uh, in this kind of art style that they have set up here. And good news, they will have a closed beta test for the game. That's going to be taking place between October 7th and October 10th. That'll be on the PS5, uh, the Xbox Series X, S, Steam with crossplay enabled so you're going to want to get signed up for that so you can join in on the closed beta there and try out street fighter 6. they also talked about resident evil they specifically mentioned the dlc coming to resident evil village that being next month this is the winter's expansion remember we saw some of the stuff around like the the third person mode which was good i am curious how some of those set pieces are going to look in the third person mode but i know there are people who prefer that over first person so good to see that in there and then of course we will see the kind of the additional story following rose 16 years later she even has the ability to freeze enemies and stuff so that was kind of cool and they did talk about resident evil 4 remake with a surprising reveal that it will be coming to the playstation 4 i wasn't expecting that one but i i, I Yes, it's it's weird because I thought this was going to be specifically for like I guess current gen now PS5 Xbox Series, but it I guess they're able to get it to work on the PS4, so they're going to work backwards because of the install size there. I don't know, let me know how you feel about that because it does make me wonder if that will hold back any of these newer versions of the game. And then we saw Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak with the new update coming out September 29th. Exo Primal was here as well and. You know, they keep showing it. It still reminds me of Anthem, but I have seen more and more gameplay for it, and I'm at least intrigued enough to try it. It's coming out sometime in 2023 across all the PlayStation and Xbox platforms, along with Steam, so maybe I'll give it a try. We'll see. And then we had the game that I was really looking forward to hearing more about. That's the Mega Man Battle Network Legacy Collection, and it looks like Capcom has quite a bit going on here. More work than I was I'll say expecting. Now, they're going to have two different volumes for this game, kind of expected with the previous Mega Man collections and how they would kind of divide them up between two different versions of the game. But, for example, the menu. It won't be this basic static menu. They're going to have a, a fully voiced 3D version of Mega Man who's going to guide you around, like, the different menus and stuff. So that's kind of interesting there. They also mentioned there will be online battle and chip trading for each title in the series that's at least something that they have working right now so i again i'm a little surprised they've gone this far with the Mega Man battle network legacy collection but i'm happy to see it still set sometime next year we don't have a release date for it but yeah i'm picking that one up day one as soon as it releases but that was the capcom showcase overall i thought it was pretty good Sure, there wasn't like any massive new game announcement, but the updates were at least solid for each title they had there. And before we go to the comment of the day, we're gonna take a look at the poll that I posted up yesterday, where I asked, how are you feeling about this year's Call of Duty, Modern Warfare 2, and Warzone 2.0? 10% said excited to play both, 18% said excited for MW2, 3% said excited for Warzone 2.0, and then 69% say I'm not interested in Call of Duty. I would say out of all the choices. I am mostly excited for Modern Warfare 2 with the campaign. I'll check in on the multiplayer from time to time. And in fact, over the weekend, I will be trying out the game in beta just to see how it how it feels and all this with the controls. But I liked Modern Warfare's campaign years ago. So I'm at least excited to check out the campaign for MW2. And Infinity War typically puts out a pretty good Call of Duty each time. So I'm certainly more interested in this than I was in Vanguard last year. And we'll finish up with the comment of the day as you're seeing here. This is from Sam saying, I hope the Yakuza studio head's response was translated literally, word for word. Him saying they think of themselves as people of the night world just makes it sound like they're all vampires. That and the underground feeling he mentions immediately made me think of the vampire dance club from Blade. Well, I have good news because a reporter did point out what all of us were saying is that there are mature games on the Switch that seem to sell well enough. For example, they said Doom, and the uh, RGG studio had responded, this over on IGN, saying, I am too thinking that the perception of the Switch is changing, and maybe because of that one day, we will put it out on the Switch. But still in Japan, the image of the Switch is more something you put next to the register at a supermarket or something, 
you'll line up all those games. If you want to have the Yakuza game right there with all the others, I don't feel like I want to do that yet. All right, so I'm not in Japan. I At the supermarket, is the Switch there next to the register with like a bunch of games lined up and they're worried that Yakuza will be there for, Like a Dragon will be there for some reason. I, I feel like there is more to this, why they're not putting it on the Switch. And I've thought about this a little more and seen some comments around the Dragon Engine and them thinking about moving away from it to Unreal Engine 5. I, I actually think that maybe the Dragon Engine is a problem going to the Switch and they just don't want to say that, oh, our engine is old and it doesn't necessarily translate over very well and don't, we don't want to spend the money because we saw what happened with the Wii U and that the Nintendo audience, even though the Wii U was not a great system for Nintendo when it comes to selling systems, let alone software. But I, th I think that's more or less what's happening here. They just don't want to say, oh, it's our engine that's kind of an issue and we can't move it to the Switch. Because, again, what's being said here just doesn't make a lot of sense. But if you're out there and you're in Japan, let me know if the Switch systems are just next to the, next to the supermarket registers with all kinds of E-rated games. And ladies and gentlemen, that's going to do it here for Newswave. If you enjoyed this video, guys, hit that like button. If not, hit the dislike. Leave comments down below about everything we talked about here. So today was the battle between Microsoft and Sony continuing to escalate over Activision Blizzard. Are you surprised that it's become as public as it has? And then what about Splatoon 3 sales in Japan and how ridiculous that chart looks? And then Tokyo Game Show has continued on. What are some of your favorite announcements? Thanks guys for watching. Have a great weekend. I'll see you back here Monday morning, 8 Eastern time for Newswave.